So I want to thank Jordan for inviting me to share with you again this morning. And I'd like us all to acknowledge that there is nothing easy about having to tackle and wrestle with scripture about a completed suicide. And yes, that is how we understand what Judas chose to do with the end of his life. And while that topic is very dear to my heart, and I believe dear to God's heart, at first glance, these scriptures that we read seem to make him the focal point. But I think as we dive in a bit more, we'll see that God is always the focal point. And there's always an invitation of hope for us. So as most of us are aware, we are in a series reading through the book of Acts together to learn about living in the power of the Holy Spirit. I think we can add the word together to the series, living together in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what we, where we kind of find this story of Peter um, is we learn a little bit in the first chapter of Acts that Luke records for us that Jesus had spent time living among his followers after he had been resurrected from the dead. Luke uses the word that he, the words do and teach. He writes, Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. I love that he got right back to ministry after being resurrected, resurrected. the doing and the teaching, both of them, not one or the other. And we know from other accounts in our Bible that he commanded them to go and share all they had seen and to do the same types of things. In Acts 1.8, he said to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then he's taken up to heaven in front of them. This is that term that we call the ascension that Jordan was sharing with us about. This is what the church just celebrated, Right? And we can only imagine what this must have been like. After all they had traveled and learned and seen by the living power of Jesus's life. And then he's taken up into heaven in front of them. I mean, to me, that's mind boggling. That's pretty amazing. So then what do they do next? I'm always fascinated by like mind boggling moments in life, right? And then what do people do next? Uh, they go back to what they know, right? They go back to Jerusalem and they gather together. But I love that Acts chapter one, verse 14 tells us they devoted themselves to prayer. They had seen Jesus do this so many times and they go back and they devote themselves to prayer. And of course, this is precisely where we meet up with Peter in our text, right? Peter stands up among this group of approximately 120 people to handle something that seemed to be important to Jesus when he was with them. Jesus had chosen 12 disciples. And so after a time together in prayer, what emerges for Peter is to, to fill this slot that Judas's death um, had brought about. And what I'd like to say about that is I've spent the last 20 years working with mental health professionals and social workers. And I've seen and heard a lot about processing grief after someone completes suicide and what it does to the community. I personally have lost dear friends to completed suicides and I've seen the rippling effects that it can have. It's just much different than death of a natural cause. And so it was with this in mind that I thought about Peter how he might have been feeling about Judas, the grief, the betrayal, the confusion, simply the agony, and also the reality for Peter that he could have chosen the same path. Both men betrayed Jesus. Both men lived with Jesus and witnessed his life together. They were among those Jesus kept closest to him. They were 
apprentices to Jesus's way of life. And they learned from the master. Like us, both men were given the gracious gift of free will. And both men could have accepted the grace Jesus so freely gives. Even after they betrayed him. However, only one of them chose to humble himself and accept the outrageous forgiveness that Jesus offered. Not once, not twice, <laughs> three times, and we know over and over and over again. And sadly, the other could not see beyond himself and the horrors of what he had done. I like to believe that the prayers of this little faith community that Peter was a part of allowed Peter time to reflect on all of this and maybe process some of the initial grief. And then like any good leader, he turns himself to take care of some practical things that are important. He needs to fill this slot, right? And so they chose two men that were among them and they were very specific in who they chose. They chose men who had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. They had seen Jesus baptized. They had journeyed with him and they had followed him through the death, resurrection, and now this ascension into heaven. And so how are they going to choose, right? How did Jesus choose? I bet Peter was thinking for himself, how did Jesus do this, right? And so they cast lots to determine who would be the one to join them in this witness to the resurrection and the lot fell to Matthias and he joined them and became what we affectionately call one of the apostles. And as Dennis Alcom reminded me, the church just celebrated the feast day of Matthias on May 14th. And I love that his name means gift of God because truly he was chosen as a gift of God. So for those who may be wondering, like I did, about casting lots, uh, this practice is actually found throughout scripture. Um, and it was utilized to allow God to direct important decisions. We see it in Proverbs 16, where it's noted that the decision is from the Lord. We see it in Jonah, actually, when Jonah's in, on the ship and uh, the storm comes and they're trying to determine who's responsible for uh, this horrible thing. Uh, they cast lots and the lot falls to Jonah. And so they say, we're shipping you overboard. And that's exactly how Jonah ends up in the belly of the whale. And we know uh, just having traveled through Holy Week recently that the soldiers uh, cast lots for Jesus's garment. So it's, there's so many examples of this practice uh, that we could go on and on. Uh, but I just think it's helpful for us to realize that this was not a random act of gambling. Rather, this was seen as a legitimate way to make an important decision that could only be left up to God. And this act of adding to the leadership of the early church is one of the ways the church spread. And as more followers of Jesus were added to their numbers, leadership was and is necessary then as it is now. And what I like to think about is this role of the apostles is considered to be passed down and honored through the role of our bishops in the church. Okay, so let's jump back a bit before this scene in Acts. In our gospel reading this morning, in John chapter 17, we have this incredibly beautiful scene that's captured of Jesus praying for his followers then and I believe now. To me, this is so powerful and precious. And so I found it interesting that my Bible put the header before John chapter 17 uh, that is affectionately termed the high priestly prayer. And again, we know that Jesus is the ultimate priest on our behalf. And so what we hear in chapter 17, maybe we didn't hear it this morning, but uh, the before and the after of what we did hear in chapters one through five, Jesus prays to be glorified 
and he makes it very clear that he is headed back to the father in heaven right so this is before ascension this prayer is happening and then second in this high priestly prayer is a lot of what we read this morning which is jesus prays for his disciples these were his closest friends. These were people who wanted to apprentice their life to the life that he was offering. These were people who had given up everything to follow him and to learn from him. And yet we know them, as I affectionately call them, his crew. His crew was far from perfect, right? They were a ragtag bunch of misfits and regular ordinary people and he prays for them. And then third in chapter 17 that we learn about is that Jesus prays for all believers. And he says, he uses the word so that they may be one as you and I are one. And he's praying to God the Father, which to me is like, wow, exclamation point, exclamation point, right? This to me is a very clear <laughs> idea of radical inclusivity and the celebration of all differences being brought together under one banner of this love and this unity of God, the way the Father and the Son are one. Again, this is mind-boggling stuff, like mind-blowing stuff, right? So our gospel reading this morning pretty much focuses on that middle part, right? His prayer for his followers. So I want to take the time to read it because I think it's just incredible. Read it again, I should say. So we read, these are Jesus again, praying to God, the father. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they were not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. So here in verse 11, we hear Jesus ask the father to protect them by the power of your name. And we know that in this time and through the Bible, names were very important. They held the key to who you are and where you came from, both ethnically, culturally, but most importantly, your name often spoke of your lineage. So I checked one online dictionary for the definition of lineage, um, and it speaks specifically of the descent from your ancestors, ancestry, and pedigree, where you came from, who you are. I think uh, we read often that Jesus was always quick to remind people that he had come from God the Father and that he was returning to God the Father because he was one with God the Father. We know from other biblical tests that there is incredible power in Jesus' name, right? In Mark 9, Jesus acknowledges that mighty works are done in his name. We know in John 20 that there is life in Jesus' name. And in John 2, many believed when they saw the signs that he was doing they believed in his name, it says. And of course, I love Acts 3. I'm, I'm hinting a little ahead of our series, but there was a man who had been lame from birth. And when Peter saw him, Peter said to him, I have no silver 
and gold, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong and he began walking and leaping and worshiping God. That is the power of Jesus name to do mighty and incredible things. So again, I find so much comfort in Jesus praying for us. And I especially appreciate that he prays and asks God the Father to protect us. And he reminds, I think, those that were listening, I don't think he had to remind the Father, but I think those that were listening, he reminds them that while he was with them, he protected them. This entire prayer reminds me of mothers and fathers and godparents and aunts and uncles uh, who love kiddos and have to watch them grow up and go out literally into the world on their own. Those moments when we can't be with them through everything. And so I'd like to ask you to just think of one child that you know that's just dear to you and think about something like maybe their first day they went off to preschool. Or maybe for some of you that hang out with teenagers like I love to do, the first time they have their new driver's license and they have a car and they can get in it and go away without you. I think that that feeling, that knowledge that you've been a part of their life, you've loved on them, you've cared for them, and they can do this. Um, but there's still that, like, they're going to do this without me, might have been a little of the beauty of Jesus's prayer. He was preparing himself and his friends that he would literally be going away, and he wanted to ensure that they would be protected while he wasn't with them. So on a somewhat relative, it seems irrelevant, but I promise you we'll get there. Uh, note, some of you have seen on social media that I just recently uh, purchased a new fun little sports car. And it's so funny, the timing of it, as I was meditating on these scriptures and thinking about this prayer of Jesus and then thinking about this new used car, uh, I was thinking of how much my dad would have really appreciated the fun of this car and how much I would have loved to have driven him around in it. And then that made me think about my first road trip without my dad. I was about 18 years old and I was driving with one friend from California to Colorado to visit another friend. And we had some stops planned along the way. We also had no air conditioning in my car, and I don't recommend that for anybody who's traveling through the desert, but it sure left uh, a great memory or two of how we tried to stay cool. Um, and so I just remember my father, as we prepared, was experiencing a different kind of preparation, right? He was experiencing this preparation of I was going away without him on this long journey. And so he did uh, something I will never forget. He sat down with pen and ink and he hand wrote out in this beautiful penmanship that he had this letter um, of rules and regulations that we should follow for our trip. And he underlined certain sections. And I think he might've even highlighted certain sections. Um, and I'll never forget one of the rules. He literally wrote, no boys in the car. And he underlined it several times, and I just felt that that was so precious and hilarious. We, of course, laughed, um, and I can safely say there were no boys in the car on that trip. Um, but I will tell you, I cherished the letter, and I cherished the care that the letter represented because I knew that at the heart of it, my dad just wanted us to be safe and protected and go and have fun, but be be careful. And so um, I thought of that in this, this just kind of love letter that Jesus is praying uh, for his followers, a kind of protection and a prayer um, to keep us, I think is wonderful. So um, it also made me think of the prayers that I pray for protection for others. Um, and the times that I honestly pray prayers of thanksgiving and thankfulness for God protecting me and protecting those that I love. Honestly, in my lifetime, I've been in several car accidents. And again, the scripture made me think of two different times when the car I was traveling in 
was hit by another car. And in both occasions, totally different times in my life, the outcome would have been very different if there hadn't been a guardrail. There just happened to be a very short section of a guardrail in both instances in two different parts of the world that literally saved my life and those that were in my car. And I just thought about how Jesus's protection sometimes is like that, right? We make our choices, we take our path, but then sometimes there's the guardrail that we're not anticipating that literally helps keep us alive. So I think it also makes um, me think of the way Jesus asks protection uh, in this prayer, the different words he uses, like guard them, keep them in your name, that they may be one even as we are one. He's asking for these things so that, in order that we might be one, even as the Father and the Son are one. Again, this is mind boggling, but he's petitioning on our behalf, which means it is possible, right? It means that with and through the Holy Spirit, it is possible. He also reminds the father and those listening that he's been protecting them, right? And so he says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, except the one doomed to destruction. So again, we're reminded of Judas. We're reminded because of free will, Judas was allowed to make this choice. And yet even in that, God was able to utilize it for a greater good that was to connect and to fulfill scripture that had been provided for us earlier before Jesus's life. This connects Jesus's life to the ancient text and to the faith of those who had come before him or his life, I should say. So then in chapter 13, we read, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have a full measure of joy within them. And I am not sure about you, but I can tell you joy is something I have struggled with for a lifetime. And I am always blessed and honored to remember that Jesus is asking for these things in order that we may have a full measure of joy. How precious that Jesus clarifies why he would pray these things, right? For our joy. And then in 14, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. But he doesn't end there and he doesn't say now get them out of here because we want to save them from that he says my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one this is encouraging for those of us who struggle i can say i do on some days with the idea that it might be better if we were just taken out of this world however Jesus makes it clear in this prayer for us that that's not what he envisions for us. That is not his best for us to simply be taken out of this world. Instead, he wants us to remain even when we are hated for the very truth of his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. Have you ever been hated for being a Christian? I have more often than I wish I could uh, count. And it hurts. It's very personal and it's very hard to take. However, I do believe there's protection from this pain and that we can join Jesus in these prayers and ask for our own protection and for those that we love. John 17 continues the prayer of Jesus, not only for these that he has lived and traveled with, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Again, that all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. This is all of us, right? It's for everyone we know, and this is the ultimate, ultimate idea of unity. 
And so this very cool reality about today, right? The Sunday after Ascension Day that we celebrate today. This is when we can meditate on another reality that Jordan also mentioned, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and that we are told that he is still interceding for us. Interceding means Jesus is still praying for us. I personally love to pray. Anyone who knows me for probably more than a minute knows my most favorite thing to do alone or with other people is prayer. I find it very encouraging that Jesus prayed for us then and is still praying for us today. And for those who feel alone in their prayers for themselves and for others, I just got to remind you, you're not alone. Jesus is praying with you. And I'm sorry, I have had a lot of prayer partners in my life. Jesus has to be the most powerful, right? So we have this beautiful, beautiful friend who prays with us. And then this beautiful prayer that we opened with this morning. I just loved these couple of sentences. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us. These words remind us that the Holy Spirit is given to us to help us in our life together while Jesus is not present on the earth. This, of course, takes us back to the book of Acts. And next week, we'll learn a whole lot about the day of Pentecost, which is one of the most fun days, I think, that our, our church uh, gets to acknowledge. It's when the Holy Spirit is poured out on Jesus's crew and helps send them out into the world to love and serve God and others and themselves. So a final thought about the story of Peter in Acts. The standing up and addressing this little community of Jesus followers. Peter says to them, brothers and si sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago. Again, this lovely Holy Spirit that we have today through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. And then he says in 17, he was one of our number and shared in our ministry. He was one of us, and he shared in the ministry. This is a reminder that G Judas was never treated differently by Jesus and his crew. He was simply a member of their community. I find this so significant. Can you imagine how others felt about Judas? Personally, as a woman, I can relate uh, to a precious story in John 12 of Mary anointing Jesus for his bur burial. And I wonder what she and her sisters felt about Judas, because as she was doing what she felt called to do, he questioned her. And he asked, why are we wasting such an expensive type of oil when this money could be used for the poor? Of course, he was the treasurer, so he cared about the money, right? But what I love is that John tells us what was really going on. He only asked about this because he was taking from the money. So we know that there was this disruptive relationship, right, in the community of them knowing that Judas was not maybe living according to the standard they probably thought he should be. And yet, even though he was motivated by money, they allowed him to be part of their community. So, what does that mean for us? And what can we think about for us? So I have this practice I like to invite people to do. It feels a little uncomfortable, 
but I think the the rewards of the discipline are worth it. So if you would take a moment to think of a person that you're living in a faith community with, someone who's really hard for you, someone who maybe doesn't live the way you think they should live. It could be somebody in your family. It could be somebody here at our church. It could be someone you work in ministry with. It could be someone you're in a recovery program with. You already know that God the Father loves them as much as God loved Jesus and you. But they can be challenging, right? And so I'd like to invite you to work on your relationship with that person. To find a way to see how we are all united in Christ and how you can unite with that person. Because as we do this, the rest of the world will notice. These are the kinds of things that Christians need to be known for. So I just say simply look around the room you're in or the room you'll be in this week and think of ways that you can begin to bridge the gap between you and someone else who's just difficult for you. And then don't do this alone. Do this by asking the Holy Spirit to help you and ask the Father to protect you. I like to ask God to help protect me by giving me wisdom in establishing healthy boundaries as I seek to love and serve others, especially the ones that are hardest for me. So since Jesus is our model of abundant life, we know that he did this. And I can tell you from personal experience, doing this little discipline is really powerful. It can be hard, but it can also be really powerful. So I'll end by saying uh, community is probably one of my most favorite topics. I have so many books on my bookshelf about community. And I spent my life trying to figure out all the ways to do life together. I often rely on the wisdom of people who've gone before. And so Jean Vanier, um, the founder of L'Arche, is one of my favorites for reading and, and learning about community. He has a book called Community and Growth. And in it, he writes, to welcome is one of the signs of true, truly being human and Christian maturity. It is to give space to someone in one's heart, space for that person to be and to grow, space where the person knows that they are accepted just as they are with their wounds and their gifts. And so my prayer for us today, may we help heal the wounds and honor the gifts of those among us such that others might see how much we are loved by God. And may our service to each other help us all choose the path that Jesus and Peter chose of abundant life. Amen.